Uf. Ready. Sebastiana. Welcome to the room. <laughs> nice to see you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay. Hi. I think I'm ready to to get started. W once Go again ahead. for Antonio and colleagues uh Victor Enrique pa is Paulo around. Thank you very much uh for the opportunity to to have a conversation because basically that's what it is and uh just to go back in terms of very quickly not so much to wrap up but just to to indicate what we tried to do to say last time and what i'm going to try and sort of get across uh this time round uh you recall that last time what we tried to do is set the context and that context basically related to the ILO and its mission how it was set up and what the different kind of expectations are in terms of delivering its, its mission in this lecture which i i intend to be the second lecture i've labeled it the second lecture what i want to do is i think sort of discuss in some detail uh not only the principles of freedom of association but the structure and the proced uh, procedures that are followed in ensuring that the the principle of freedom of association within the high law is uh, respected and uh, just to mention that the principle of freedom of association as i did before is at the very core of ILO values. It is enshrined in the constitution 1919 and was also uh, sort of amplified by the declaration of La Philadelphia 19 1944 and more recently 1998 in the declaration on fundamental principles at work. And of course, beyond the ILO itself, uh, the right of to freedom of association is part of the universal declaration of human rights and it is seen basically and i know professor antonio uh, you are a scholar of uh, social dialogue it is seen as a sort of a prerequisite if you like to collective bargaining and social dialogue but but in spite of many changes now uh the the in spite of this acceptance and embodiment in the in in, in the international norms of neighbor norms it is there are still challenges around the uh the enforcement or rather implementation of, of freedom of association and as we go you see uh those challenges in terms of the cases and what they mean and then when we come uh next lecture by the way professor antonio if you can uh, allow me to to step back i had intended next lecture to be to look at freedom of uh, association and democracy but i have rethought that on reflection i think it's better that in the next lecture we look at the global and you know regional impact and this is what we we're going to sort of look at brazil latin america and other uh, other uh, uh, regional kind of uh, formations as it were but for now i want to focus as i keep saying on the freedom of association and uh, just to mention that freedom of association of course even though it is principally uh, sort of uh, applied or expected for workers, it is also uh, available to, to employers. And in fact, there have been uh, over the years now, I mean, the, I should mention this in passing, that it's very rare now that you get any kind of complaints by employers. What you tend to see, particularly 
uh, during the several years I've been part of this uh, is that they are what you might call proxy kind of uh, uh, <laughs> complaints. And it's suspected, particularly in Latin America, that, you know, sort of there may be instances where, you know, this is more or less enjoined from somewhere. In Africa, it has tended to now, uh, now in terms of the, the International Trade Union uh, Congress, it has tended to be more or less a, a proxy kind of sort of uh, getting around in terms of China, because China, uh, even though is the one of the leading, and we shall come back to that in the next lecture, uh, is it hasn't uh, ratified the the conventions 87 and 98, and the same, by the way, with the US, they haven't, but that does not stop, as we know, these uh, conventions applying to them, but there's a, uh, the, 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 the relationship with China is particularly interesting, and I'll, I'll lift that out when we come to look at the global and regional impact. So in spite of all that, in spite of the entrenchment, the right to freedom of association is still a challenge. You know, lots of restrictions uh, to levels of public servants and it's in countries that you wouldn't expect this to be. And I'll come back. Uh, I think I'll, I'll, I'll endeavor to remember that, for instance, we have uh, problems with one of the most committed ILO members, and that is Japan, in terms of the public service. They don't cover it and they don't respect, uh, you know, the full measure of freedom of association. And of course, in particular, uh, uh, there are limitations in terms of other categories of workers, seafarers, export processing zone, which has taken root in Africa, uh, for instance. I'm, I'm not sure, Professor Antonio, about Latin America, whether you have got this uh, phenomenon of uh, special export zones, where, in fact, governments restrict the application of the principle of, of freedom of association. But more alarming has been the sort of the continued, in fact, the escalation, and you see, when we come to looking at the regional impact in Africa and Latin America, the arrest of trade unionists uh, sort of is not abetting. So there are still those challenges. And uh, so the, uh, the CFA, the Committee on Freedom of Association and other supervisory mechanisms of the ILO, the mandate of the committee is to resolve difficulties concerning freedom of association as a fundamental human right. And when we talk of human rights in the universal declaration kind of global sense, and the, the two core conventions, as I keep mentioning, and I'll keep mentioning, uh, 87 and 98. Uh, Convention 87 sets out the right of workers and employers to establish and join organizations of their own choosing, and also not least uh, to be free to organize without any administrative uh, interference. Uh, they also have the right to establish uh, federations and uh, confederations, and also much more importantly, and this uh, particularly uh, in Africa, the right to affiliate to international organizations. Again, I think uh, when we come to Latin America, Professor Antonio, you can sort of, uh, you know, enlighten us in terms of what the pattern is in terms of uh, in terms of affiliation. But what we have seen in the committee is that Latin America has got less of a problem. In fact, hardly any, uh, apart from one or two two countries, that 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 what is not in, infringed. It may not be respected in every uh, sort of aspect in terms of practice, but at least it's not infringed in law. So beyond that, what we have, Victor, can you, <laughs> Victor, can you indulge me? Thank, thank you. Uh, so what we have is that 98 uh, is the, the convention that grants protection against anti-union 
uh, discrimination. And it's one of the areas I'm going to come to because you you see as we go down, there are so many areas that we we can't cover even if we had a whole week in terms of you know item by item. So what I've uh, I've decided to do is to choose four that we are going to to look at later on but we haven't come to that now for now oh i'm i'm sort of i'm saying is that convention 98 uh also enshrines the right to collective bargaining there are other related conventions you have the workers representation convention 1971 uh that's one one three five you have got rural workers organizations and you have got the labor relations public service and the uh, a collective bargaining convention, convention which is uh, glossed over uh, normally, and this is the one in 1981. And also there are other broadly kind of relevant instruments in terms of freedom of association. I've mentioned the ILO Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work. Uh, in, 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 in respect of these norms, conventions, and other norms, member states have got the obligation to promote and realize principles concerning, uh, you know, fundamental rights. And of course, uh, freedom of association is one of them. And the uh, collective bargaining is actually regarded, as I mentioned earlier, as a, a unique and distinct form of uh, social dialogue. Victor, please. Now, I want us Friends, to... You, could you admit, uh, could you allow me to make a question at this time? Because yes. uh, uh, to some extent, I, I will convey you <laughs> the, yes. the question that some uh, uh, ask it to me. To what extent you, uh, we can assert that the ILO uh, effectiveness could be um, relevant to make countries like Brazil finally yeah. accept the uh, 87 convention, for example. Yes. Uh, what are the well, yeah, mm, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, Professor Antonio, as you know, it's one thing to ratify these things, and it's another to apply. Uh, we, I think we have a better sense of that. You, you, you have given a sense, I mean, in your, uh, your chapter that you we sort of the book we we contributed to there is a sense of distance distance between what is reg registered and what is in practice and there uh, when we come to the cases that we are going to we have got about three or four cases we are going to look at uh, concerning brazil i think that will come come out very clearly but at this time just to mention and emphasize that it's not unique that you have countries that have ratified uh, particular conventions but the practice is not realized and that's uh, the reasons for that are many was, typically it could be lack of uh, political commitment uh, capacity particularly in developing countries and the uh, one would have not thought of Brazil, in spite of <laughs> you have, re, you know, I, I don't have to 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 stress this that you you know you you may have your challenges, but challenges of capacity and in, in what is relative to the others is is not pales in comparison. So there are other dynamics as well that affect that. So the uh, the. The, uh, the, that I think would be the the general broad answer at this point. I think it's it's worth coming back to when we what I've done, uh, Prof, is that if you go to the uh, to the end of the PowerPoint, I've lifted out some areas for discussion. Uh, I don't know, Victor, where, whether those will be. Have been circulated. Uh, it would be interesting to to bring up some of these issues as part of this, that discussion. But I appreciate your your flagging it that this is an issue. I think that we need to look at where the the schism, if you like, the 
uh, the gap between uh, ratification and implementation. And it's something that we are also going to to come back to when we look at the uh, freedom of association and democracy. And also when we reflect at the end of in the lecture five, when we reflect on what lies ahead in terms of uh, the IRO process on freedom of association. So that that's uh, I think I should leave it at that. Uh, freedom of association and collective bargaining, of course, as I keep saying, founding principles of the ILO. Uh, the after eighty-seven and eighty-seven was ninety uh, forty-eight, and the ninety-eight was forty-nine. I th I think I'm I think I'm right, uh, Prof. Uh, <laughs> correct me if I'm not. Yeah, you see. 48 and 49 after the uh the adoption of these uh two conventions as the the ILO went on especially after 19, 1944 uh in particular in 1947 they decided that uh it would be meaningful to establish some additional machinery, particularly to emphasize to those members, member states that had not ratified 87 and 98, that they were part of these fundamental principles, you know, in the preamble of the association. So the Committee on Freedom of Association was established in 1951, but it did not uh, start work until 1952, which incidentally, was the day or the year I was born. <laughs> so when when I sort of uh, accepted my appointment, I I jokingly reminded the governing body that I was grown up. Uh, you know, in, in in Africa, in Africa, you sort of uh, you are not allowed to eat with the elders on the table until you are grown up. So I said, look, I'm as old as when this this committee started you know, to work. So I'm old enough to chair it. And that's, uh, yeah, so it was, it's a, it's, a, it's a year I always remember because it coincides with the year I was born. So the purpose of the CFA is to examine complaints of alleged uh, infringements and violations by member states, uh, you know, sort of, uh, uh, and, Sometimes uh, employers, uh, employers' organizations, whether they have ratified it or not. Of course, the employers' organizations do not have a sovereign liability or right, but you know, it normally tends to sort of to come. It's the member state that I think is liable uh, to to implement and respect and promote the uh, freedom of association, and that, as I said, was uh, included in the preamble. And then it was also reiterated uh, there is a, uh, an international labor conference resolution on, uh, of 1970 that affirmed uh, that principle. Thank you, thank, thank, thank you, Victor. So what we have is the Committee on Freedom of Association, which is a governing body committee. Uh, I take it, Professor Antonio, that people roughly know the hierarchy in terms of the governance of the ILO. The highest kind of de decision-making body is the International Labor Conference, which passes the law. You know, you can liken it to the legislature. And then the governing body is the executive of the, uh, of the office. In fact, it's regarded, it's referred to as the governing body of the International Labor Office. You know, there is that very slight you know, distinction between the organization and the office. So this is the executive body that uh, acts on behalf of the uh, the organization through the office in between uh, conferences. So the Committee on Freedom of Association is a committee of the governing body. It reports to it uh, and is accountable to it. Even though recently 
it uh, the committee has been asked to to table its reports to the committee on the application of standards. You remember last time I mentioned that there are three principal kind of oversight and supervisory structures. We have the Committee on Freedom of Association for freedom of association and collective bargaining. We have the Committee of Experts on the application of conventions and recommendations, uh, which is an independent body. And then of course we have got the Conference Committee uh, of the International Labor uh, Conference, which is the uh, Committee on Application of Standards. So the CFA, starting I think from, from last year, we were asked to table our report to the CA, uh, the Committee on, Free on the Application of Standards, but just for their information. We do not report to them. We, we, report, we are a committee of the, the governing body. And the committee is presided over by an independent uh, chairperson. And for my scenes, I'm that now. They have, uh, they have extended my term indefinitely until they can decide, or in fact, the entire committee. I'm not an employee of the ILO, and I'm not paid by them. <laughs> so it's, uh, of course, they facilitate my, my travel all over the place, and then, you know, going, going to attend the three sessions a year, uh, and so forth. But um, I'm not an employee of the ILO, I'm independent. And in You've fact, been uh, You've been exploited by ILO. <laughs> Yeah, yes, I mean, sort of, it's a level of love, yes, <laughs> level, and talk of exploit, <laughs> exploitation, yes, there it is, it's a level of love. I think the origin of that, Prof, was unlike the, the committee of experts who are actually paid for the work they do in reviewing what, the independent chair is not, is not paid at all, and my, my sense of it is that up to now, it has tended to be uh people much more distinguished than than i who have made their fortune either as the high <laughs> high ranking government officials or you know sort of like my my predecessor uh sort of who for the the hanjin was he was a very kind of sort of respected uh he's, he was a, a rector of the uh the university of Leiden and with other kind of sort of things to do it's like he didn't need, need the money kind of thing. <laughs> yeah, but that said, it doesn't, doesn't bother me because for me, this is a labor of love and a great honor. So I don't mind it at all. Uh, I, I'm not out of pocket. <laughs> Let's put it that way. They, they do get me where I, I want to get. And then they, uh, unlike, uh, I don't know about you uh, at the University of Sao Paulo where whether academics travel business class or first class <laughs> i never did <laughs> so but they do they fly me at least business class and <laughs> believe me when you are going we are like, it makes it makes a lot of difference so i don't mind at all and but so it's a tripartite body it's a tripartite body of nine teacher members yeah three representing government three representative worker, uh, workers and three employers. Now, there is a, I think I must mention this as part of our reflection, that there is some doubt as to whether uh, the status of these members. They are, of course, uh, appointed in their individual capacity. But the I mean, the dynamics and the politics of it, and in fact, we have just had a, a very kind of sort of, uh, uh, if you you allow me to digress, we have had a, an issue concerning whether uh, the office can deal with members of the committee directly, or they have got to, to go through the spokespersons. Because what we have is that of those three groups, they are spokespeople who kind of canvas or call the whip in parliamentary terms. And then, of course, they, they answer to their, their constituencies. So there's that disjuncture between the fiction that these people sit in their individual capacity, and yet in terms of views, both what they bring and in terms of their approach to, you know, to, to their work, 
they are really representing their, you know, governments, uh, workers and employers. And that is six each now. You remember I see three titular and there are three each uh, deputy, but they all sit uh, and it makes sense in terms of, you know, uh, the, making sure that the work is as the, as shared as much as possible because what what normally happens is that they will take turns in terms of who uh who alleges and who defends in what particular uh, uh case and then uh normally more often than not uh at least during my tenure I've had to depend on the on the middle ground of of governments in terms of sort of bringing the uh the parties together. So the the committee, the CFA, decides to receive complaints uh, and establishes uh, facts in dialogue with, with governments. So basically, uh, what will happen is that the uh, where a you know sort of uh, evaluation of uh, freedom of association principles is alleged. Uh, the you know that that complaint will come to the uh, to the committee through the office of course, and uh, is uh, uh, typically uh, in terms of uh, eligibility, it is only uh, an employer's or a, a, a workers delegate that can can sort of uh, uh, table such allegations and complaints. And more often than not, particularly in non-democratic countries, it tends to be the international uh, kind of secretariat, so particularly the unions that uh, the ITUC, the International Trade Union Congress, and the IOE, the International Organization of Employers, tend to be the ones that I think sort of speak on behalf of uh, members in countries that have got no voice, so to speak. And where, in terms of uh, uh, e, e considering those uh, those reports, allegations, where we they are founded, so to speak, uh, you know, sort of uh, we report to to the uh, the recommendations of the governing body, and then sort of uh, also recommend how they can in, implement to bring. Uh, their actions into line with freedom of association. But where there is a, a member as the ratified either of the conventions, they, and there is a legislative matter, then that is referred to the Committee of Experts uh, on the application of conventions and ratifications. I think in, in, recent, in recent years, there have been about uh, nine such, such instances because the uh, more often than not, the committee of experts who deal with those infringements as part of the Article 19 and Article 22 reports to them in terms of legislation. So we haven't seen as uh, as many of that. And of course, they are apart from considering uh, the complaints in committee, uh, the uh, you and the making recommendations. There are other ways in terms of implementing. And that's another, Professor Antonio, who you probably want to sort of to discuss that. And this is, this goes to the implementation. How is the implementation? Because that is a sort of a perpetual kind of issue in, in any matters, you know, concerning international norms. How are these implemented? So in terms of implementation, uh, there would be, our report goes to the governing body, with a recommendation that you know the governments come back to report on the measures they are taking but in certain instances there are other ways of intervention you for instance you they will send a direct mission but even during the uh the session of the cfa itself there are direct contacts and i spent uh i normally go <coughs> uh to geneva for the sitting of the committee, which is about a week. And then I hung around for another week. And most of my work then is uh, to sort of to respond to any calls for meetings by ministers uh, to the conference and also the permanent 
you know, permanent uh, missions as well. So th those are interventions as well in terms of what you do. So in, uh, and that goes on, yes. Uh, did you have anything, were you? Yeah. Yes I, yes, I was just wondering if you have a, a, a sort of a role of mediator in some instance in this, uh, as the share person. If you yes. have a, a role of mediator and try to put together a different perspectives of... Yes, I mean, sort of, first of all, I mean, it's, it's interesting. Thank you for asking me that I was uh, right now, because I was going to talk to it in terms of how I play my role. My role. I'm independent, and uh, in terms of uh, uh, the committee is expected to decide by reaching consensus. So my, uh, this is Professor Antonio. This is the most difficult job I've ever done, and you know, funny enough, I love it to bits <laughs> because it it, it 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 speaks to my pre pretensions of. Uh, knowing human nature and then you know, being a bridge builder uh and what will happen is that uh it's, it's like sometimes it's like just being in negotiations uh, uh more often than not matters of fact can be contested but more often than not it's a question of what happened who did that and what what the remedies going to be what kind of uh consensual decision the recommendation we are going to you know to reach over and that's where my role comes in in terms of sometimes of course i'll i'll, I'll speak to to spokespersons and groups independently the latin americans are particularly sort of robust in you know in seeking every time there's a session there's a group called grurad they have got regional groups and the, every time Gruraj, you know, takes me into account to explain what I'm doing. You, you see why when we come to look at the, at the spread of the decisions in terms of Latin America. So I play that role. I've got to sort of to explain to, you know, ministers especially who sort of will come into the conference and of course their, their mandate is, you know, to, to push the line of their country as much as possible. And the the poor diplomats have got to defend it. I've got to to explain, and uh, you know, so it, it's that, yeah. And the, sometimes, I mean, you uh, you try negotiating with China and Cuba, and then you find out what it really means, you know, because the line that is put, uh, you know, particularly Cuba will say, we were found, founding members of this organization. We respect freedom of association. And then you have got your allegations. And this, these are a bunch of criminals kind of approach. It's the same with China and uh, some other countries. It's not only Cuba. And then you've got to sort of to sit down and so the, you know, negotiate in terms of trying to explain that you know, these are things that they signed to you know on that these are not things that are being imposed particularly with china china will come back repeatedly uh, they will change tack i say you know you look at our constitution you look at our laws we guarantee and respect freedom of association and then when you sort of you pin them down in terms of what is actually happening an interesting case now uh, if I may digress a bit, is that we have now, in fact, that hasn't been solved at all. We have about 35 people that can't be accounted for. You know, sort of uh, according to uh, international human rights uh, organizations, these people have just disappeared. So you go, and then we, we issue the report. Of course, we go to name and shame, and you are taken on and saying in fact the last meeting and this is the uh, this is public knowledge because it was interrupted in geneva was where i was confronted and say look how do you expect china china has got 2.1 how do you expect me to find five you know it's like we're looking for a needle in a haystack and i, I said to him 
Uh, luckily, I know China fairly well. For the last five years, I, I was director of the Confucius Institute and got to know China very well. So I said, you know, Your Excellency, the People's Republic of China has got the most kind of efficient ad administrative system in the world. I'm sure you can find them. That kind of thing, you know. So <laughs> this is that kind of contestation. You've got to to try, and uh, uh, and 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 the more or less the, the sum them, and you know they and they will they will re resort to to threats against the I know, not against me. You know, same will say, look, here we are, we are, we are, we are paying so much to maintain this organization, and this is what you are thanking us for. Said, Your Excellency, what we are trying to do is help you, you know, sort of meet your obligations, that, that kind of thing. So you are right, there's quite a bit of <clears throat> negotiations, not only as within the committee itself, but with the governments when I, I go and meet them. And uh, over in nearly 70 years now, the next year, the CFA will be 70 years, and we are hoping, uh, COVID allowing, that we can make, uh, make an occasion of it. It has uh, considered over 3,300 kind of sort of complaints and still in increasing. Victor, ah, uh, well, yeah, yeah. So the CFA, just to run through quite quickly, sees three times a year. We only have enough time to consider about uh, 30 maximum in terms of complaints. And those complaints are the, at different stages. You have comp interim kind of uh, uh, decision, recommendation, and then sort of de definitive, uh, you know, sort of recommendations. but we all hold over quite a lot of them. We can't deal with them. So at any given time, like now, I think we are, we must have at least 130, you know, pending cases. And God knows how we are going to, to deal with those. So we have arrived at a, uh, at, at a system that allows us to consider the relatively more urgent cases, like where these people are in, are in jail, they are imprisoned or, there has been sort of so outrageous kind of violations. And, the, uh, and the, of course, there are certain countries, uh, the so-called repeat offenders, they, these are not offenders, of course, that we always keep a very close uh, sort of watch over. And we try to do that. And the, there are also special pro procedures of, you know, uh, deciding uh, what to do in paragraph uh, the 14 of the CFA mandate consists in determining whether any registration or practice complied with the principles of freedom of association and collective bargaining as laid down in the relevant con uh, conventions. So in, in 2009, the governing body approved the inclusion of a compendium of, of rules that that you know govern our uh, the way we proceed, and uh, again I think is is uh, important, and this this talks to the purpose and responsibility of the CFA. Its function is not to formulate general kind of conclusions concerning a trade union of freedom of, of association situation in a particular country. Its mandate is to consider specific allegations. So you can't say, look, on the basis of the reports, one can say the entire situation in Brazil, you know, infringes freedom of association. There have got to be specific allegations that we consider. You know, and that, that's the, the mandate we have. Uh, in, and the aim, of course, of the intervention, and this, Professor Antonio, you might want to flag it as another point, a talking point. Uh, our intervention, and this always sung, is a swan song, is not to criticize unwittingly, but to engage in constructive, tripartite dialogue to promote freedom of association 
and trade union law, uh, you know, rights in law and practice. What that means, uh, you know, has been, is something that, uh, you know, can be talked about. When does this constructive, when doing recommendations not become criticism? For instance, how far does the committee, because in some, if you look at some of our reports, they are very categorical in terms of, you know, uh, sort of, uh, not telling off, but telling it like, like it is in terms of, you know, the, and you, one can't really uh, pretend that you are not criti criticizing, but of course it's couched in recommend recommendatory terms and all that, yeah. And there are, of course, the rules of, uh, 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 you know, uh, that make any complaints ad admissible. There are conditions for admitting complaints. They must be clear uh, indications of what the complaint is. Uh, the, they must be made by an eligible body, either workers of employers, organizations, and they must be in writing and signed. Uh, it's not only employers and and workers, but also some NGOs who have consultation consultant status with the ILO can make uh, you know complaints. And in fact, quite a few complaints come via that way, where you know sort of uh, uh, a, a so an organization, a human rights organization, and normally like the, uh, you. Was is it the rights watch or who have who have a a complaint and they often they would they would kind of sort of channel it through the ITEC or one of the uh, the the IOE so it will it will come through there and yes, uh, yeah. sorry to to interrupt you again but just uh, I, I was I think it's a it's a very interesting just to explain to us how do the NGOs uh, achieve this uh, consultant status uh, be, uh, before the ILO? I mean, is it a, a, a procedure or a certain nature yeah, of it? I think there's a procedure, which is a general, I think, UN procedure, where they have got to apply and then satisfy certain conditions. And those conditions, of course, uh, in the case of the ILO, one would assume that they would be uh, concerned with social justice, that they would be sort of, they would be patently not party political in a sense, even though a lot of these uh, NGOs, of course, do have uh, a political mandate of, of some kind or another, whether you are talking about climate change or sort of, uh, uh, you know, rural workers and all that. So it, it's that there's a criteria in which and the, uh, they tend, I think this is, tends to be a UN wide kind of process. And the, some of them just, you know, sort of uh, happen to be uh, concerned with the labor and social justice. So it's a process, a technical process, I think that gets in. But even that, I uh, was uh, talking of Human Rights Watch, for instance, they tend to work through established labor organizations, you know, to, for, 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 it makes it easier in terms of channeling those complaints. So, uh, for instance, a lot of complaints we receive about China. Uh, the informers, even though it's brought by the I ITUC, is not the ITUC at all, but the, the NGOs on the ground that gather this information. Some may or may not have uh, consultant status to the ILO, but they channel them through the ITUC. And the the other requirement, yeah, if I must mention, I should mention in passing, is that, uh, you know, a, a complaint or allegation should not simply be purely political. Again, Professor Defletas, that is another question. How do you decide what is, uh, you know, purely political or not? And this kind of problem comes, comes uh, to the forefront, particularly when you deal with protest kind of uh, uh, matches and all that. And it's interesting that uh, there is a caveat that says, okay, uh, simply because 
uh, a protest is uh, on about is you know is is political and about social economic work that that doesn't make it political so it's always a, a contentious area in terms of with governments because uh, they tend to be dismissing this in, in africa it tends to be this is all about the uh, regime change what these what people want and that is very uh it has been very common if i may mention in uh, eswatini uh former swaziland and then zimbabwe of course where uh you know there are these protests and the government's always sort of dismissing them off as the political kind of machinations uh, at the aim that re regime change and do not have anything to do with trade union rights or social social justice so that again is a very uh, contentious line between what is purely political and what is the political economy, if you might, you might put it that way, with sort of economic and social social implications. And in terms of these uh, allegations, there is no requirement that for the CFA to be seized of a matter, for a particular allegation to have exhausted national remedies. That is another very interesting one that comes up particularly from governments now and again. And the response is that, look, we do take account of uh, uh, exhaustion in a sense, but not in the, uh, in the way that governments tend to take it. For instance, if there's a case pending before the courts on the same matter, uh, we will step back, even though we have learned now that in most cases, uh, and I will mention one one country, for instance. Again, this is the common knowledge in uh, in public records. Uh, you know, Pakistan and Iran, where these they take forever. You no, know, years. You are talking about and Afghanistan as well. You you are taking years, sort of something dragging on for twenty years plus. Is still dragging through the courts when. Uh, can you say that uh, you know national that that kind of what needs to uh, to be respected? So it's always a contentious area, and in one the committee uh, more often than not, whenever I meet the ambassadors, uh, I've got to press in terms of when this is going to come, and then you know they will, they will explain it away, and they will simply say, and this is the other interesting thing uh professor De, uh, defletters because i don't know how it is in brazil but uh, in uh, in a lot of countries uh ministries that are in charge of labor and employment are not economic ministries and we are talking not only about the underdeveloped countries we are talking for instance about japan where the 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 department that is responsible for the ILO is the Department of Labor and Employment. But the department that is in charge of the public service is another department altogether. And normally they will be passing the bar, saying, you know, this is not our responsibility. We deal with this. This, you know, is another department. All we can do is table your requests, and we have done that. You are very interesting, and that's in fact the uh, the contention in Japan now in terms of uh, why they can't they have ratified both eighty seven and ninety eight. Why they can't uh, they, they 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 can't sort of uh, bring about laws that respect those conventions, and it's interesting in the case of Japan because they keep saying, look, uh, by public opinion. They don't want civil servants to have the full measure of freedom of association because they regard civil servants as pampered and over, over kind of sort of uh, uh, compensated with sec security of employment, secure pensions and all that. And beyond that, why should they have the right to, to negotiate with government? It's amazing. 
it's a sort of a, so you have these kind of contestations within the architecture of governance who is responsible for what uh, and so forth and uh, so it's 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 a very kind of contested uh, uh, area in terms of how you approach it and now I just want to come to the to the what is in in, in effect the Bible of the CFA and that is the the what used to be called i think you recall this professor antonio used to be called the digest it's now called the compilation of of cfa decisions in fact i've got a copy there. And, uh, i don't know whether you is this visible can you see yeah this is oof. It's about it's a about 340 page kind of Bible that contains uh, decisions or a rendition of jurisprudence and the guidelines and precedent, and that is uh, intended to foster a firm universality, continuity, and of course. Uh, make the decisions of the CFA as predictable as possible. So, and this is on the website, uh, scholars, you can, it's on the ILO website, and uh, it's regularly updated. It was, uh, they changed from digest to, to compilation. Uh, before I joined, I sort of, uh, I took over as the uh, presiding officer, so to speak, of the committee. And I gather there were a lot of dynamics about it. Uh, many of them I still have, I haven't uh, got to the bottom of, but there, were, there was a lot of co contestation, particularly between workers and the uh, employers' constituencies as, about what to include there and what to discard and all that. But in the end, it covers about uh, 20 key areas uh, and with two an annexes. One is on the special procedure, which I've been uh, referring to from time to time as I went, and also a chronological case of, of, of cases. And uh, e these, the focal areas include, uh, there's so many of them, it's procedure in respect of social partners, trade union and the employers organizations rights and civil liberties the right of workers to establish and join unions right to establish organizations without prior authorization right to join right to draw up constitutions and and the rules and the right to elect representatives so they are they are sort of uh, there are a lot of them if i if you uh, may go up uh, victor please yeah, uh, yes. And uh, it, as, uh, as it was this before you are going back? This uh, forward, please. Forward, forward, Victor. And yeah, so there, yeah, there are those. And the next one, please, the next slide, Victor. Thank you. Yeah. So there are all these, including uh, multiple kind of uh, headings and subheadings that essentially uh, sort of uh, uh, the focal areas that the uh, the uh, the compilation deals with and uh, what i've done for the purpose of this lecture as i indicated is for us to go through about four of them just to unpack a bit and please i can't hear uh, I can't gauge whether the pace I'm taking is too fast or not. Could you give me some feedback? I'm, I'm quite happy for you to stop me, uh, you know, as Prof. Uh, Antonio uh, sort of kindly does from time to time and ask no. me about certain areas. Am I too fast? <laughs> you know, I, yeah. you have all the time. Just, just go ahead and uh, we are. Yeah, okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, the, 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 yes. Evans? Yes, Anna. 
Christos. <laughs> so, is a new there with you? No, today is he's not. He's no, not. today okay. I'm not yeah, you, you must tell him because he, last time, I think he was right saying it's all very well to talk about this theory. Now I'm trying to talk about the practical. <laughs> so tell yes. him. I heard him. Very okay. <laughs> Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, yes, you are saying, Anna. Yes, uh, I would like to hear you about what is like the formal status of the compilation. Like the formal status. Are they? This is, you see, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Look, that also is contested because the digest, the old times, they tended to take it as a Bible, right? The employers now, at least some circles within the employers group, are much more doubtful about it. But that doesn't stop them. If, if And I think this is a, a much more kind of realistic answer, is that whenever we, uh, we are discussing any issue, the interesting thing is that all the parties, and not least the employers, who keep reminding <laughs> you know everybody else that this is not part of the you know the completion but his status is is just a sort of like a guide it used as i said it used to be my my impression is that it was much more authoritative than that before now it's just a a guide a reminder if you like particularly when it comes to but certain issues that they were dealt with this way it's like sort of keeping back and trying to, as a court would do, to try and sort of maintain some kind of precedent. But having said that, it's like the, the House of Lords in the UK, where, you know, they now can overrule themselves and sweep away precedent. So that does not uh, stop the, the committee, at least that's my understanding, of sort of uh, going on and, and remember, Anna, it's, it's always this, this, this restriction that what the committee is dealing with is not a general situation. It's a particular specific situation. And that allows, I think, the scope to distinguish particular issues, you know, instance from, from other, uh, other words. So I, I think that's my sense of it, that this is not, uh, a, a sort of a, a Bible the way it used to be, but it's not taken lightly because the, all the, the constituents, they, they, they you know, uh, use it in terms of um, elucidating what and the, uh, reminding uh, themselves as it were. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, thank you, yeah. So, uh, Victor, please indulge me. Yes, so what I've said, as I said, what I think I've, uh, I thought might be useful for us to do is focus on a number of areas and try to unpack them, have a better understanding of what their scope and how they work in practice. And I thought we should look at trade union and employers' rights and liberties, the right to strike, which I'm sure, uh, uh, both uh, Prof. Anne and Prof. De, de, de Freitas you find interesting because this is something that you have confronted yourself in your way, and then discrimination, and then collective bargaining. Let me start, uh, uh, Victor, please. Let me start with the trade union and employers' rights. And the Professor Antonio, I recall this is part of the syllabus in terms of trade union autonomy, and I hope this adds to that. Uh, it, this is essentially about trade union autonomy. That uh, trade union rights, they are related to civil liberties as under fundamental to democracy. That's the basis of it. So uh, the CFA emphasizes basic principles set out in the Universal Declaration of on Human Rights. Uh, you know, sort of that if you, 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 uh, infringement of that, what is, can, can sort of uh, 
uh, infringement of these rights is uh, an infringement of the right to exercise uh, freedom of association. And that, go that was uh, affirmed as far back as 2006 under the old digest. Governments therefore uh, enjoyed, enjoined not to interfere in the activities of workers and employers organizations. Similarly, governments are obliged to defend and maintain a special climate, a social climate that respects law and guarantees trade union and you know, employers' independence, irrespective of what their political affiliation is. And these rights include the right of uh, unions and employers' organizations to administer and organize, establish they, they are, you know, sort of the organizations to affiliate and draw up constitutions and rules and to choose their representatives freely without interference. And that, in terms of uh, continuing history of infringement of what is still a problem worldwide, that, you know, uh, in many places, the unions do not have, and the employers for that matter, do not have the right uh, to choose, uh, you know, who their own representatives freely. But that is a cardinal point in terms of the, uh, you know, the uh, trade union rights to maintain autonomy, that the unions uh, should be uh, free to, you know, both run their activities, choose office barrier, bear, uh, you know, bearers, uh, in fact, uh, uh, formulate their constitutions and the uh, and rules of, on how they operate. As long as, of course, it goes without saying, there is no infringement of, of the law. But that law itself doesn't have a free range of of impact. It has got to be within certain con constraints respecting the. Uh, freedom of association. So this is essentially, when you talk about uh, civil liberties and trade union rights, you are essentially talking about trade union autonomy, for them to, uh, to, to sort of to run their own, uh, you know, their own uh, business as it were. So that, that's what is uh, free from interference from governments. And uh, that's essentially what this is all about, and quite a bit has been decided on this in terms of, you know, privately uh, previous kind of practice. And it's still, as I, I keep saying, it's still a problem worldwide. Is there anything that uh, you'd like me to add here? Okay, let's move to the right to strike now. And uh, I'm just wondering if if we can please indulge me. Can we take a a, a comfort break <laughs> for ten minutes, Professor Antonio? Right? Yeah. It's a note, so. uh, oh, okay. Okay. Ten minutes. Yeah, yeah, right yeah. Now? Uh, ten minutes, please. Yeah, yeah. If we can, oh. I, I don't. I want to come to the right to strike with a fresh mind. <laughs> okay. Please. Yeah, yeah. No, right. Thanks. Thank you.
Halo, 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 colleagues. Hello. Are we back? Hi, can yeah. you hear me? Ready to yeah, welcome back, welcome back. Ready welcome to back. Yeah. And very. Uh, Victor, very can you restore my my Victor? Can you restore my 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 PowerPoint, please? Yes. Yes. And professor, we're back just to to understand what is the exact status, legal status uh, of yeah, the, the right to strike, right to uh -huh. strike. Yeah. Since we don't have a a convention specifically devoted to the right of strike and the ILO, right, so yeah, it's not ready. Right to strike. Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Do you see my screen? No, I can't. It's not on screen. No. It's not on the screen. I don't know what's uh. And now, Professor, do you see now? No, it's not on the screen. I don't know why. I can't see it. OK. Um, yeah, le let me let me ask my my IT consultant. Are you winning? OK, I I'll try again. I'll try again. Okay, please. And now, Professor? Nope, it's not yet. No? No. No? And now? No. No. No? Let let, let me make this from my side. Let me, let me, uh, uh, you know, ask Basiana to help. Just a moment, please. Okay. Eu, eu tô achando, Vitor, que possivelmente ele não está abrindo. Ele deve estar com uma, abrindo em closed caption e ele não está vendo a PowerPoint porque eu estou vendo inteiramente aqui. Ah, beleza. Deve ser isso mesmo, né? Talvez é. a Talvez tenha é, entrado em descanso a tela dele, né? Então, não sei se isso dificulta, talvez. E se ele está, talvez, trabalhando com telas, né? Não sei. É. Então, a, a, começa, já vai, já vai a apresentação direitinho, abre aquela tela do Rider Strike. Tudo bem, tudo bem. Hello. Sim, talvez... You can share, I'm sure. Mm. I have to open the PowerPoint you sent them. Okay. So their screen is not working. But what have they told you? I'm trying to reinstate it, but it's not coming through. Okay. Uh, who, did, who did you send the PowerPoint to again? Okay. Just, just to let you know, Sebastiana, we can we can see the we can see the presentation pretty well here. Yeah, but we I can't. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. So, so it's him who can't. I can't see the presentation here. Uh, there. Okay. The yeah. So, no, I think this is what I was opening. 
Okay. No, this is the, what you said. Mm. Uh, do you think maybe the solution would be me to us to be allowed in again? Okay. <laughs> then I redial. You mean you 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 present, you presenting from your from your screen? I see. Sebastiano, what do you plan to do? Oh, ela saiu. Acho que ela vai tentar voltar, né? É, eu acho que ela pediu para se logada de novo. Ó, oh, eu acho que ela tem. Tá is that right? Did you get it? Yeah, you got it now. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sebastiana. You have a good idea. Thank you very much. I'm sorry about that. You know, sort of okay. the, the tribulations of being a BBC born before computers. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. Welcome back. And uh, you know, sort of, uh, let's go on and look at the the right to strike. The right to strike. I think it cannot be overemphasized that the right to strike is fundamental to freedom of association because it's the it's a tool of defending economic interests. The right of uh, to strike was developed by the Committee of Experts as part of their jurisprudence because I uh, may, maybe in, initially when we talked about the different committees, maybe I did not, I should have emphasized that the, I think one of the major differences between this committee and the committee of experts is that uh, this committee is a, a tripartite committee with an independent chair. In a sense, even though we have got rules and the conventions to guide us, the outcome that we reach, which must be by consensus, is really a question of political accommodation, much more political accommodation than the, the Committee of Experts. I mean, the Committee of Experts, for starters, there are 26 of them. Uh, you know, your sort of, your types, uh, Professor Antonio and Professor Anna, these are distinguished professors, at least half of them, uh, a quarter probably. And then uh, on the current committee, you have no, no less than uh, the current chair is the former Chief Justice of, of Panama. And then you've got uh, two or three former Vice Presidents of the International Court of Justice. Very distinguished people. These are lawyers. Whereas we, what I'm dealing with here, uh, in terms of the, uh, the Committee on Freedom of Association, these are really sort of social partners who are who see things differently, and uh, uh, much as the lip service is paid to the need to to have consistency and the, and continuity, uh, they don't really uh, they go particularly now. The employers now tend to go much more strictly, and this is more or less uh, uh, part of what. Uh, I would refer to as one of a type of strike. They go, I think, word by word. And uh, so the right to strike was developed by the Committee of Experts as part of this jurisprudence. And the, the phrase has been banded about that what they said was collective bargaining without the right to strike would be no more than collective begging 
because you wouldn't have a, 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 a weapon to enforce it. That was essentially at the core of the right to strike. And that over the over the ages, so to speak, came to be to be it. And uh, uh, it was affirmed in many CFA cases and uh, you know sort of uh, uh, precedents. But it's, it was it has never been it was never provided in the ILO constitution. It was referred to, uh, you know, as time went on, affirmed in the. Uh, declaration of fundamental principles and all that, but it was never really part of any normative instrument of the ILO. And that now, in recent years, has given rise to a lot of contention, particularly from uh, employers, some employers' circles. And uh, at a political level, I, I feel for my colleagues in the Committee of Experts, because uh, they are not popular with one of the constituencies, at least some circles, with the CFA, they say they are represented. So, and that is what now they are pushing towards. They have put this, uh, the right to strike on the table. And uh, the, the word now is that they want the Committee on the Freedom of Association to decide on this issue, whether there is a right to strike. Of course, nothing has been sort of tabled as such. Uh, I suspect, but it is uh, in the mix of the, uh, the, the review mechanism, the standards review mechanism as part of it. So this has never been uh part of any normative instrument of the ILO, but is seen as fundamental and that the committee of experts have affirmed it and uh, it's uh intrinsically uh, a corollary i think to the right to organize protected by convention 87. the right to strike is uh similarly uh seem to be available to federations and confederations and the confederations uh, it's also available in, in, in terms of economic and social issues. You remember I, re I referred to the pro protests, uh, protests that might be political, but have got social and solidarity implications. Uh, the next word, uh, please. Victor, is that? Uh, yeah. And again, the idea is that, and I spoke to this area, is that strikes that are purely of a political nature are not per se protected by 87 and 98. And that, in fact, was uh, affirmed in a, in a case, I think this, I, I, I sort of uh, forgotten now, I think it was a Colombian, a Colombian case that, that he affirmed that way, way back, that that was so. But, the recourse to protest action criticizing uh, government economic and social policies is permissible. It's, 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 it's part of the, the right to strike. So is uh, the so-called sympathy or solidarity strikes. These are permissible as long as the initial kind of uh, uh, strike is lawful. If the strike and there are instances, there are a few instances, uh, I think, uh, believe it or not, where the parties themselves would limit their right to strike, uh, you know, or, you know, in, in, uh, for, for a particular reason. But the, the ruling on this is that where there is even the parties where they, they, they sort of they, they restrict the right to, to strike, it must be compensated for by uh, a rapid recourse to impartial or speedy mechanisms to to resume to resolve disputes, and so the, and that is uh, is not as widespread. So basically, I think the right to strike tends to be one that is contested for in the workplace as against employers and sometimes governments. Many times, governments joining being part of it, and uh, the right to strike can only be uh, is very. Closely defined, and can only be restricted 
uh, in essential services, which is defined, and public uh, services of a fundamental nature. And even those instances where, you know, sort of minimum uh, service may be provided. The next slide, Victor, please. Uh, essential services are defined as those services whose interruption could endanger the life, personal or personal safety or health of the whole or part of the population. And that this, believe it or not, I don't know about Brazil, uh, this has been a, a sort of uh, a bone of contention in a lot of countries, uh, definitions of essential services, where uh, some have decided that, you know, teaching is that certain the police are in, you know, or obviously, and you, uh, you know, uh, not to mention health services, but is if you take an ideal in terms of, I say ideal, in terms of uh, international labor standards, I think South Africans legislation is ideal. It defines it very, very strictly. And in fact, it sets up uh, a system that demarcates what is and what is not an essential service through a tripartite structure and provides procedures and processes how minimum uh, uh, service is going to be to be provided. And uh, the, the other issue, of course, that you might be interested in is whether the right to strike is compa comparable to to that of local art. I mean, they have got the, the similar kind of uh, purpose, and that is to exert uh, economic pressure on, on the other party, but they are not the same because sort of uh, uh, he, the right to strike is much more pronounced and he, the, the right to local art is much, much more restricted. At least it has been in terms of uh, both in many kind of national jurisdictions and the, at the international uh, labor organization level. And the right to strike, of course, is willful or temporary stoppage of, of work, and it can be by uh, or slow down by workers to enforce or resist demands or express grievances in solidarity or support of each other. And uh, there are different types. There's the, the so-called wildcat strike, tools down, go slow, work to rule, and uh, uh, restrictions uh, can only be justified if a meeting, uh, sort of a strike is not peaceful, in, in which case, of course, uh, if you are talking about law and order, uh, as a restriction, that intervention could be allowed. But even then, they have now, uh, the ILO has developed with the social partners a very, in many jurisdictions, with the help of the, the social partners, a protocol of how the, the police should in, intervene in those cases where, uh, you know, strikes are not peaceful. And the ne next word, uh, Victor, please. Thus, uh, for instance, it has been decided, and this is, a, this I think is, a, uh, there have been instances in Latin America that where there is occupation of plantations by workers and other persons, which lead to acts of violence, even though it, might, it must be, one must hasten to, uh, to add, at least in the recent cases that we have considered, it tends to be at, you know, with great uh, pro provocation and the intervention of said third parties. But if it does uh, turn violent, then the authorities are en entitled to enforce a peaceful uh, sort of a evacuation and, and normally not, not simply administratively, but, you know, more often than not, the the employer who apply for a judicial injunction of some sort, yeah, and uh, it has been decided too that you know sort of uh, he, where uh, the the uh, the uh, of the, I think I've gone on to 
uh victor sorry i've I think I've gone into collective bargaining now, haven't I? And union designation, what was, yeah, essential, yeah. What is the next one? Ah, what is the next one now? Now it's and union. Uh, I, am I finished with the, <laughs> sorry, very sorry, I'm, I'm confusing myself here. Uh, similarly, yeah, to strict strikes, and then what's the next? The next slide, Victor, please. Santi Union dis discrimination. Oh. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So that's the right to strike. And I thought we, uh, people would like to, for us maybe to chat about the right to strike. What is it about the right of strike? Uh, other than the fact that this is uh, a fundamental uh, weapon if i may put it that way that makes it such a a contentious issue i don't know about what the the situation in brazil is prof Anna and the prof antonio is this an issue that it is that Evans, is, yeah yeah unfortunately yes it is <laughs> so go ahead. Mm -hmm. evans i have two questions Yes. One is uh, you have you have explained how the right there is all this debate on the right to strike being part of the principle of freedom of association and how the employers have been opposing to this understanding. Yeah. From any strategic point of view, do you think it makes sense? For example for workers to push forward a convention on or recommendation on the right to strike or it is better just to uh, keep the the argument that i'm totally uh, agree mm -hmm. with that it yeah. is part of the principle of freedom of association mm -hmm. that would be my first question and the second and is on political strikes, huh? because we yeah. have had a, a recent decision by the Superior Labor Court in Brazil, yeah. very restrictive of political strikes. And it would be interesting to hear from you on the committee position on the subject. Yeah, okay. Uh, to starting with the first question, how I'm inclined to think that strategically, it would not uh, be a good idea, definitely not practical, because in terms of what is there, the right to strike is until recently. We are talking within the last five years that all of a sudden the employers have turned and said there is no right to strike. All along it was accepted consensus that there was a right to strike. Oh, of course, they always complained about it. The idea that the workers now should embark on pushing for another uh, convention, I think would not be practical. They will not obtain the kind of consensus. The employers will not give it. And the, uh, I don't know whether you followed what it took to put the, the centenary declaration in, some, in place. If you looked at the original kind of sort of idea of that, which included the, uh, uh, you know, the a work, uh, the right to work contract, which the employers would never contemplate. It was a much watered down just to to get that declaration. I can't foresee the employers agreeing, uh, you know, to the right to strike in a, co a new convention. Rather, kind of sort of push, continue. The law is on their side. That's this is what the law is. You know, it's, it's not. Uh, it's been established by. Uh, if if uh, I suspect that the the employers dare not take this matter for an advisory opinion to the International Court of Justice, because the outcome would be the same. You do. I don't think it would depart from there, and I suspect they know that. Yes. So my sense is that I think it would not be strategic for, for workers to push for a new convention, rather sort of continue. And now there are indications that is uh, 
that there is a sort of uh, some opening up of uh, real discussions. Basically, as I, I mentioned in passing, the act that the sort of some workers, some employers have is about the uh, the resentment against these this band of wise men and women in the committee of experts that pronounce on everything and they regard them as most of them as green type types who figo fibo liberals who want to <laughs> you know to, to, to sort of to dictate to dictate to that is part of the problem but it's also they, they have now gone to the extent that uh, there was a time when tenure on the committee of experts people were on that until they you know they lost it they changed that in my view that was a reasonable change to say look people are going to serve a, mass, a maximum of of you know five terms i mean 15 years three years at a time and uh the employers now particularly the current uh vice deputy chair of the governing body the employers one are pushing for new rules now you know basically uh if you are you are a member of the committee of experts your term is more or less renewed automatically unless you sort of it's very difficult to imagine that anybody would really antagonize people because it's their own body they're not sort of uh you know unless, unless they fall out and these are these are very judicious people. They don't fall out easily. Uh, they would be that. And the employers now are contesting that. They want to uh, to have the renewal of those terms, you know, sort of considered all over again, that it shouldn't be automatic. And of course, it's, it's an attempt to change the nature, the character of, of the committee of experts, because they think it has been, you know, sort of loaded with too many liberal uh, judges and, and professors. And that incidentally was the, has been the issue with the, the Committee of Experts as well, in, in terms of, you know, the, I mean, the Committee on Freedom of Association, even though the, uh, that, I think, as I said, is not, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't raise their, their resentment as much because they, they have got a forum in which they, they fight on an equal turf, so to speak. The second word, Anna, I, I passed me, was it about police intervention? It was about police, in, can, can you repeat yeah. it, please? Political strikes. Yeah. Political strikes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, the, yes, yes. Uh, you had, want to, yes. We have please. this decision that yeah kind of says that political strikes are not strikes. They are not protected under the Constitution as a fundamental right. And I'd like to hear the position of the committee because yeah. I know there are differences. Yeah, yeah. No, in fact, the position of the committee has always been, we haven't considered it recently, but it has always been that political protests, as long as, you remember I referred, as long as they deal with economic and social issues, those are valid. It's not, and this is why I said, it's very difficult to disentangle between what is, you know, purely political and what is political with implications uh, of, of, of uh, economic and social implications, particularly now in the in heightened kind of challenges about social justice. So I would imagine that we are that to come by way of, uh, uh, of course, the committee uh, has got no mandate to review the, you know, the Brazilian Supreme Court of Appeal uh, decision, but we are it to come as, a, as an allegation or complaint. I think they will probably, uh, you know, sort of uh, uh, take an opposite decision about it because it's so it's so fundamental and entwined. Because you know, protest, political protest with uh, uh, social and the economic kind of imperatives is fundamental. 
in terms of uh, you know influencing or even changing the the position of governments on certain matters. So it's part it's part of it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I totally yeah. agree with it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the the, the 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 other what I want to move on now is the the element of uh, discrimination. And when we talk about discrimination in this in this context, we are talking about uh, anti-union discrimination. So of course, one of the most serious violations of freedom of, of association, and in many cases actually puts the, the existence of trade unions in, in jeopardy. Uh, you know, the, it's not allowed and it's uh, to require employment that should depend on belonging or not belonging to, to trade unions. Similarly, persons should not be dismissed from or prejudiced in employment on account of their trade union membership or activities. Uh, and it's important, I think, in the case of federal states like Brazil, because quite a few uh, a few federal states in the past have come uh, with the defense that, you know, a certain matter that infringed, uh, you know, that resulted into discrimination against unions was uh, within the competence of a provincial or state kind of jurisdiction and not that of the federal state. But in terms of, uh, and that in, in terms of the the approach of the CFA uh, is the member that is held accountable. The member state is made, held accountable, regardless of what the internal arrangements are. So, if, for instance, I mean, it's very similar. I mean, if uh, federal states, I think it's a similar problem to the problem of ratification as well, that, you know, sort of where uh, a particular convention is uh, ratified by member state, its implementation and this uh, application and this uh, bearing in mind that we are dealing here with a, a fundamental uh, principle that in which uh, sort of prior ratification is, is not uh, in essence. It means is that it's the federal government that is responsible. That, you know, where there is that, that discrimination internally, it can't uh, sort of avoid liability by blaming it on a, uh, an autonomous state responsibility. So, uh, and the, the important things in terms of uh, really protecting trade union officials is that this discrimination applies both to current and, and former union officials because there have been cases, particularly in Africa, where you have uh, for a time current trade union members will be protected, you know, sort of, but once they are out that, and some don't leave employment, they are still in employment, they are targeted. And that that is also uh, uh, anti-union discrimination and is not allowed in the uh, CFA kind of jurisdiction, yes. Victor, please. Now, it's also not uh, a defense to by an employer to say, look, I have subcontracted a particular kind of uh, a part of enterprise to somebody else. They remain responsible for what the subcontractor does. And that can be a basis to evade anti-union discrimination. In conditions of imminent civil law, civil war restrictions, for instance, to prevent sub sabotage in public utility, may be permissible as as long as it is intended. It is not intended to engender anti-union discrimination, and that was decided in the uh, in two zero zero three, uh, the old digest. The the CFA. Uh, doesn't have the mandate to pronounce about a particular a sort of breach of contract of employment, for instance, say dismissal. 
except where there are elements of anti-union uh, you know, dis uh, discrimination. If, if in fact, uh, anti-union discrimination is, is the basis of that, the dismissal or the, the breach of contract, then it is within its province to provide support. And there are different types of va various forms of discrimination. You, you know, they, they relate to hiring. You can't hire or not hire because somebody is a member of a union. Uh, you, during employment, itself you can't discriminate uh, you know uh, can't have anti-union discrimination uh, you can't dismiss uh, people in a discriminatory way based on the membership or not or unions and above all you can't target union officials and have black lists of people on the basis of uh, uh, trade union activities and uh, it is and this is another area i think that we should probably come back to as to whether uh there can be any discrimination against employers uh and it's a moot point a moot point not very clear but it has been decided in the past that it's possible to have discrimination against an employer for instance in instances where of land exploration uh in a sort of uh, uh reposition and composition uh, the is expected that uh that composition and the you know sort of uh, seizure by law has got to be uh first of all the the composition must be real realistic and then the the seizure uh should be uh should be fair and in fact there is a case in southern africa against zimbabwe where the, the there was a regional tribunal here where they decided that the seizure seizure of uh, of land in you know sort of white farms in zimbabwe was was unlawful and of course what did what happened what happened is that uh, the zimbabwean regime uh, more or less uh, managed to get yeah, the other members to dissolve the tribunal <laughs> on account of that. So there, there have been cases where uh, there is a connection between the seizure of land and labor matters and what it means against the employer. Next, Victor, please. Now, let's come to... Just a, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but just... No, I, no, no problem at all. No problem, Professor Antoine. I'm looking at the point. Uh, well, I think there is a question about uh, the right of strike from Antonio Galvão, but before his question, I would like you to uh, tell us if there is some case uh, discussing specifically the liability of the subcontractor company in terms of uh, anti-union practices of the subcontracted uh, 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 enterprise or, or company. I mean, the, the classical uh, issue related with the uh, chain of uh, production liability. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not, not, not any of I can call offhand, but the, the, the principle Professor Antonio has said is that that kind of uh, the employer, the primary employer, let's, let's put it that way, they can't evade uh, liability simply because they've sub, sub, subcontracted it to, to another, to another sub-employer. And the one who do expect, uh, I suspect this might turn on the, on the national kind of law that uh, they would be both individually and severally liable, you know, for, for that infringement. Definitely in the South African case. The South African case now in terms of what they call uh, outsourcing and, you know, uh, broking, they now make it the responsibility of the primary employer, you know, for any infringements in terms of workers' rights. But that uh, does not exclude totally. And they do that, uh, you know, sort of uh, 
the liberty because more often than not you find that the these subcontractors in, in in some cases they tend to be former former employees who depend yeah uh, for for most of their survival on the my primary employer so they don't really have i mean many of them if you take the south african and namibian cases many of them have got no other means of business other than the, <laughs> the main employer so they are just kind of sort of doing the bidding if you like of of, of the main employer and the, more often than not uh is they evaporate if they are targeted because they don't exist on their own so it would make sense i think uh you know to 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 get to the primary employer but having said that as i said i is something that i'll try and look up for to see if there has been a case recently uh yeah i should do not not that if there had been a case recently where this has happened and what has happened in that case thank you Thank you, Professor Epes. Yeah. So, Antonio, yeah. I'm at your microphone. Antonio? Yes, Professor. A different uh, Antonio. Hi. Hello, hi. Professor Evans. Hi, Antonio. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity to be here listening to your lecture. Yeah. Uh, my question was related to, to the strike, uh, the right to strike, but is also related to the next uh, uh, title of your presentation uh, Collective Bargaining. Yeah. Uh, it, it is about the whole of the less representative unions uh, yes. or neighbors, uh, Uruguay and Argentina are facing this, this problem right now. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. In Argentina, uh, it is forbidden uh, to the less representative unions to, to start a strike, but yeah. uh, it happens. Uh, yeah. and, and in Uruguay, uh, there are also uh, uh, very recent decisions saying that the less representative unions can uh, negotiate too. Uh, does the, the, the committee has uh, uh, a position uh, related to the whole of the less representative unions on the, regarding the, the right to strike and regarding the right to, to negotiate? Yeah, yes, I think the cardinal rule is that when you talk of most representative uh, unions. It's usually about representation to the ILO, not within countries. Within countries, there are rights for minority unions, to, not only to exist, but to pursue their activities, like any other union. What happens um, uh, normally is that you you probably get a third a third hand in the whole process. Where and this, in fact, when we come to look at some, uh, if you look at some of the uh, the problems in Latin America, the conflicts between unions, which are perpetrated and encouraged by some employers and the state to get at each other's work. But in terms of the their rights, of co and in many cases they coexist. These minority unions are. Uh, recognized. Uh, of course, in terms of uh, uh, solidarity, it is uh, it is a thorn in, on the side if you you have uh, workers' organizations uh, second guessing each other, and it's not unusual, Antonio, to have the the parties, the political parties behind this, in terms of making sure that the uh, the union solidarity is is lessened. So that's that's a but in terms of those rights, I think most representative unions uh, you go by the rules of uh, the national registration. They will carve out who who is entitled to bargain, but that that law, as I said at the beginning, should not be that the expense of discriminating against a particular union in terms of rights to. You know, to sort of to to organize and carry out their activities. Otherwise, it's only valid when it comes to deciding who is going to to represent a particular kind of uh, movement, labor movement, at the international labor conference. The rest is within registration, but that the registration, as I keep saying, has got to satisfy 
the requirements of freedom of association. That is to say that, you know, unions uh, should be given a space, uh, minority unions in particular, have got a right to exist, uh, to coexist with other unions. It's not only always ideal, as I keep saying, but that I think is the attitude, yeah. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, uh, so let's move on to colleagues now on to collective bargaining. Uh, this is the fourth area I thought we should do focus more closely on. And the requirements, the expectation here, uh, freedom of association expectations is that collective bargaining is the intrinsic in, in freedom of association. Therefore, member states are expected to encourage and promote the full development and uh, utilization of machinery for voluntary negotiation. Remember, when we talk of collective bar bargaining, the underlying principle is got, it's got to be voluntary. It's not sort of structured in a way that he force uh, you know, agreement upon parties. And that, by the way, you might, you might say it's uh, elementary, it's not, because there have been now, there, there are instances in terms of law, for instance, and this is, if you take uh, the latest uh, case we have had with Cuba, where you sort of, uh, they say, look, we have by process of law, and that uh, uh, Antonio incidentally goes back to your, off, to your question. The, they will say we have by profess, process of law who is recognized and who is not recognized as a, as a trade union. The rest are criminals. And uh, the, the idea uh, in terms of CL, CFA freedom of association principle is that this is about voluntary neg uh, you know, uh, negotiation. It's not about enforcing the state preferences on the on the partners and therefore you need to have in place uh you know a machinery that allows and guarantees uh the freedom of workers not only to to combine into uh you know into independent unions but to to negotiate freely with the uh, at various levels of course the uh every most mo most uh, uh, industrial relations system do have levels of where you can negotiate, whether you are talking about plant level and all that. All that is within within a, a national kind of framework to be uh, to be decided. But uh, it must have the the uh, uni your collective bargaining must be guaranteed at a, at every level and on the basis of voluntary negotiation. Next, Victor, please. So, and collective bargaining includes public servants. And even now, it's amazing. I don't know about Brazil, but in some countries now, when you talk about the public servants, it includes the army. In the, we had a uh in the last last committee is is left now the the workers representative from norway was actually a soldier from the union of the the army south africa they are also allowed to uh to to enter into collective bargaining and have unions uh of course the contentious uh sort of tend to be the police and and the army as i said but also the prison services. And in terms of uh, uh, Convention 151, uh, public servants are not excluded per se, except, of course, certain bans, the, the very top kind of word, yeah. And in some, uh, and this is also interesting, you have, you have uh, probably, I'm sure, Professor Antonio and Anna, you may remember the famous British case of the the spy center, where which excluded, you know, to this to this day that is being held to be 
uh, an off uh, in conservation of uh, of uh, uh, of uh, both 87 and 98. So it doesn't, you can't exclude just by, uh, you know, by choice, uh, what, what public servants you want to exclude uh, completely from that process, from unionization. I mean, it was always open and will always be open, I think, to, uh, to national authorities to restrict who, in terms of ranking, for instance, the, the army and the, the intelligence kind of uh, operations, what kind of people should be, uh, you know, should be allowed to be in the unions or not, but it can't be on the basis of a blanket ban of, of those, of those services. And the, the, the scope of collective bargaining is wide ranging. It uh, even includes what type of uh, agreement you want to have, what type of instrument you are going to you are going to use. Uh, it, it it covers wages, benefits, allowances, working time, annual leave, redundancy, provision of trade union facilities, and even access to the workplace. Uh, so so it's wide wide ranging, more or less. And again, the important thing in terms of freedom of association is that this choice of subject matter over to over which the bargain should be of free choice between the parties. It's not something that that, that, that the, uh, an authority can di dictate. Any, well, yeah, thanks. And the scope of uh, bargaining, it can't be excluded by law. It can't be sort of be on the basis of uh, imposing penalties on the parties. For instance, uh, I don't know about uh, Brazil, Professor Anna and uh, Antonio, there has been in Southern Africa a multiplicity of the so-called soft law, which basically is the cause of practice that provide guidelines. And there have been tendencies where there will be certain restrictions that where the parties have agreed to a code of conduct, they shouldn't depart from it. But in terms of the, uh, the, the, the principle of collective bargaining here is that you can't, you can't restrict, you can't penalize people for not following that at all, because that is, uh, you know, sort of, a, it's an agreement while encouraging uh, people to deal with with each other uh, in in sort of in a in a manner that is consistent with the good uh, negotiation, it can't be used as a basis of uh, of punishing or penalizing uh, you know uh, people parties to that. And the, the, uh, that, as I keep saying, is going to be an autonomous process. They may they must be. Where there are, there must be facilities, mechanisms to to facilitate that collective bargaining. Uh, either sort of, uh, even the the provision of conciliation and mediation, where the parties fail to meet, their minds fail to meet, and uh, uh, of course the CFA, and this has come through the cases, attaches a lot of importance to the principle of bargaining in good faith. And that has got, as, as we see, I think has got uh, some very practical implications in terms of what is the, the principle of bargaining in good faith. And uh, if I, uh, uh, Victor, if you go up, I think it's the next slide. I'll show. No, no, they, yeah, let me talk about it. It's not, and e essentially what I meant is that uh, uh, there have been instances where uh, there has been lack of, uh, you know, bargaining in, in good faith, where an employer will enter into uh, into negotiations, knowing very well that you know they sort of they don't have the mandate or the power to deliver on the outcomes. And this principle says an employer uh, should, you know, he, he should engage with the 
with uh, their workers' counterparts in collective bargaining at an appropriate level. And this has been a problem, by the way, in terms of, uh, again, I don't know about Brazil, but this has been a problem in a lot of, uh, uh, in some East Asian and African jurisdictions with the public sector, uh, you know, bargaining, yeah, bargaining process, where the, uh, the fiscus, the, the money, depends on the on the legislature to authorize so you can't go uh, sort of uh, they have now worked out some protocol you can't simply say you know uh i will not as government as employer uh, i don't have this money because it doesn't depend on me it depends on on parliament so that is not good faith kind of bargaining, and it has caused quite a few problems in a lot of uh, jurisdictions. Normally, what what they have tried to uh, to do in some some uh, some instances is that they will uh, government, I think, as part of the bargaining process, will probably give a sort of uh, a margin within which. Uh, the parties can can negotiate, but even that is regarded as uh, too restrictive at times and interfering with the principle of voluntary uh, political uh, collective bargaining. And then, of course, there are other principles there that relate to uh, collective bargaining, the representation of unions and non-unionized workers, recognition, which again Antonio will come back to in terms of most representative organizations, determination of trade unions and and the uh, employers' organization entitled to negotiate, rights of minority unions, levels of, of collective bargaining and restrictions on which I've talked to on free and voluntary bargaining, collective bargaining in the ILO center, in the ILO, in the public sector, but also important, and this is uh, an occasion, uh, sort of, an issue that has only come up occasionally in the ILO itself is the relationship between different kind of ILO conventions. So for instance, if you take uh, the area of freedom of association, the hierarchy is very clear, 87, 98, and then there are the others. And sometimes uh, they are kind of, not exactly contradictions, but sort of, uh, it's juncture that needs to be to be resolved in terms of the relationship, and usually it has been uh, been the process that collective ninety eight, for instance, is the, the promoter of freedom of association in negotiation kind of. So you have that intrinsic kind of relationship. So there isn't really any any kind of sort of conflict. Between, uh, between different ILO conventions that cannot be aligned. And then, of course, there are issues of time limits in terms of due need to place times on, you know, on when you can, uh, you can agree, duration and extension of collective agreements. In, in some jurisdictions, collective agreements are, are enforceable contractual obligations. In others, they are not. They are sort of uh, uh, voluntary kind of agreements. The important uh, issue is that uh, where these agreements have been arrived at, they must be adhered to yeah, between the parties. That is part of the act of good faith. So it's not uh, okay, there can be a distinction in terms of whether they are legally binding or not. I mean, traditionally in the Anglo, uh, sort of American law, they have tended to be uh, in, in the English law, not in the American, uh, uh, no, let me not confuse, not in the American system, in English law, they were, these were voluntary agreements. Of course, in the US, they are, they are contracts, specifically contracts. So it differs from, you know, from one jurisdiction to, to another. But the point is that one has got to, to emphasize is that the, uh, these are agreements that have been concluded in good faith and the expectation is that the parties will apply them and implement them.
The next word, please, Victor. Now, I had here a number of discussion points. The inherent link and between freedom of association and collective bargaining, I think I've talked to that. The supervisory impact of tripartism on decision making, that is in the CFA, you are expected to reach decisions by consensus, which makes, as I said, it makes my, it makes for some doing. It's very, very difficult. You sort of, uh, I've now, I'm beginning to learn a few tricks in terms of, you know, bringing the, the parties uh, together, adjourning, you know, uh, you, you, get, you get into these tricks, adjourning the liberations, knowing very well that, you know, there are some members who want to go home and all that and they become impatient. It's, it's an art, it's, it's amazing. But in the, in the end, so far, we seem to find ourselves. But the bigger question that I think I should pose is, what is the impact of trapeatism? Now, again, when we started, we saw that as the basis of the ILO. And it was a novel kind of a departure from normal, a unique kind of structure where, I mean, up to that point, governments decided everything. They governed, they had the, the right to govern in their own terms. But this ILO uh, sort of uh, innovation was that in matters of social justice, you needed stakeholders to have a say in it. And that has increased, not only in terms of the way the ILO operates, but in terms of the way, for instance, the laws are, are made now. There was a time when labor registration, in fact, before the word processor age, I don't, uh, uh, you know, except for, <laughs> For those of us in what with nearing senior moments, I think I don't think a lot of you uh, you remember that there was a time when before the word processor where you had to to go, you didn't know what was in one one document from another, and it was the made mockery of the ILO specialists that sometimes they would forget that what the law they were. Uh, sort of recommending to Papua New Guinea had Tonga in it, I have forgotten to leave it. So they had this kind of straight jacket, you know, which they recommended to their parties and so to governments and governments kind of sort of imposed that law as long as it did not infringe uh, ILO ideas too, too much. They all did in those early days, but now it's inconceivable that in in many kind of accountable kind of jurisdictions, it's inconceivable that any law would go to parliament or to the legislature without an input from the social partners. So that trapatism comes to bear on the outcomes of the kind of laws you have. But it's now being criticized as being excluding some vital stakeholders the social partners, the NGOs who work in the trenches. Because, and this will come back to this later on. You might, you, it must be sort of reflected on the basis that in many, in many countries now in the developing world, uh, I don't know what the proportion is in Brazil, but I know that like everywhere in South Africa now, which is the, the biggest, most industrialized country in Africa. The split between the formal sector and the informal sector is 40% for the formal sector. And uh, is still, uh, still declining. In many countries in Southern Africa, can you hear just, me? Yes, yeah, so it's just about the same. Yeah, about the same, yeah. And in many Af sort of Southern African countries, like Zimbabwe, it's about 5%, the former sector. And the argument now is, how can you exclude so many people? 
from this, uh, from your conversations on, on social dialogue, your conversation about sort of constructing, say, social protection, when so many people are out of it. But that is, that's an, in, uh, um, I just want to leave that with you. It's, a, it's now a very interesting uh, kind of issue in the ILO itself. And it's one one issue surprising, maybe not surprising, where the all three partners are holding onto this, you know, and saying, no, we don't want any newcomers. South Africa has tried, by the way, in terms of to let the 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 fourth party in, in the national economic and developing development uh chamber, they have got a a civil, a civil society representation, which for the most part they just ignore. So it's a very interesting issue. How do you, is it possible for this tripartite kind of approach to endure? How can you enrich it and reach out to the, to the you know, to the uh, social partners? So it's, it's very interesting. And then of course we have discussed the, uh, the limits of constructive engagement is there a right to strike and what's its source? I think I mentioned that. And the scope of anti-union uh, discrimination and the principles and stop scope of, of uh, collective bargaining and freedom of association, which at best really is, is uh, an element of social dialogue. So I think, uh, Professor Antonio, I, I'll stop here now and the, uh, next, uh, next week, I'll, I would like to suggest that I go and look at the global and the regional impact uh, before going on to democracy, because I think that would be important. And can I, can I sort of request in advance, Professor Antonio, that you know, sort of, in a way, you you should do kind of. Uh, help me lead that discussion because that's where we are going to focus on what's okay. happening. In this way. Yeah, please. Okay, I'll be yeah. we'll be in touch. Yeah. Professor yeah. Vincent, yeah. again, thank yeah. you so much for your wonderful, delightful and enriching lecture yeah. this yeah. afternoon this evening for you. And uh, <laughs> yeah. any yeah. questions yeah. if you don't want to to commit slavery. Thank you very much. And Victor, thank you as always. Anna, remember me, remember Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. I can see you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Good night, Enrique. I can see you. Yeah, yeah. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Professor. Bye-bye.